Graham Harrell of Hydro Building Systems is a member of NLA's Net Zero Expert Panel. And Hydro is an aluminium and energy company committed to developing natural resources into products and solutions in innovative and sustainable ways. So Graham, um, as I understand it, using hydroelectric power reduces the carbon footprint of aluminium product manufacturing. Uh, can you tell us how that works? This relates to the production of what we call primary aluminium, which is taken from uh, bauxite mining, and the world still needs a certain amount of primary aluminium. But the conversion of bauxite into <clears throat> a billet of aluminium that can then be processed is traditionally a very intensive, um, energy intensive process. So what we've managed to do is through our own hydroelectric um, power generation power stations uh, is, is hook those into that production process. Um, so that in addition to trying to reduce the amount of energy in the process, we can use renewable hydroelectric power to effectively transform bauxite into a billet of aluminium. And um, we're quite a long way uh, down, down that journey. Uh, the aluminium itself is perfectly standard primary aluminium with no changes to the uh, real production processes or the science. Um, but just really by bringing in the renewable energy, we've been able to get the, 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 the global warming potential, as you would see it in an EPD or the CO2 equivalent um, per kilo uh, of a billet of aluminium uh, down to a figure of about four kilos of carbon per kilo of aluminium. So to give you some context for that, um, the global average for primary aluminium is 16.7 kilos per kilo. So it's less than 25%. European average is somewhere at just over eight. So, so it's still a kind of 50% reduction. Um, so no doubt using renewables has had a big impact on that process. The journey for us going forward is to further enhance that process. Um, the use of renewables probably can't be increased that much more in where we use it now, but we can use renewables in some other parts of the process and make them more effective. So our mission is to further reduce that 4.0 in the future. So that's how we, that's how we use our hydroelectric power in primary aluminium uh, production. So um, BS6001 um, uh, zero, zero, shows that uh, uh, a lot allows manufacturers to show that their products have been made with responsibly sourced materials. So, and your, your products meet the standards today? Yes, the, the, the 6001 is effectively a standard that's applied to uh, companies or operating units. Um, so um, Hydro Building Systems as a UK company is certified to a BES 6001. Um, however, I would add to that that in um, the London and market, certainly with bigger projects, a lot of material finds its way into facades through non-UK um, companies, including Hydro European sister companies. So the BES 6001 only operates um, as a British standard really in the UK. So for responsible sourcing uh, outside the UK, the Aluminium Stewardship Initiative, which is equivalent to the Forestry Stewardship Council, um, that scheme is, is a global scheme. So that whether product comes in through primarily a European route as an overseas route or through a UK route, um, the hydro companies that supply it um, are part of either one scheme or, or the other and the BRIAM responsible sourcing uh, kind of criteria are met by either BES 6001 or by the Aluminium Stewardship um, Initiative. So we have to make sure that we're wider than a kind of a, just a, a British standard uh, approach to responsible sourcing. So how, how should designers differentiate between pre and post consumer waste or scrap content in recycled construction materials? Mm, this, is, this is a really big important question because historically the focus has been on the word recycled uh, which is a quite a generic description of a, many many different processes um, pre-consumer scrap is still an important part of aluminium production um, and there will always be uh, waste from uh, production activities of material that never actually reaches its final destination and, and finds a use um, 
and so it must be reprocessed. It's quite a simple process to, to reprocess and it's quite a low energy process to do so. But, and this depends slightly on which um, LCA methodology one might choose to embrace, that pre-consumer scrap comes with burdens that relate to its original production because it's never found it, it's never found a use. Um, so when that goes back into recycling, it comes with, for example, a CO2, a CO2 burden already. Although the process is quite simple to recycle it, um, it comes with some it comes with some strings attached, if you like. Um, Post-consumer is a far more complex process. But the advantage is because the aluminium materials had a life, in, let's say in a building for 40 years, um, it comes effectively without a burden. So uh, in terms of its embodied CO2 content, it's quite an attractive um, product to put back into the chain, um, but it's more difficult to process, um, as you would imagine. Um, so it is important to understand whether you're recycling pre or post. Um, and nowadays, we, we in hydro building systems have been able to get it so that about 70% of our systems for facade, uh, facades actually uses post-consumer. And the balance is uh, some primary and some pre-consumer. But the emphasis now is, is for us is very much on post-consumer. So, so can you tell me how, how a facade, for instance, can be recycled to, to best effect? Uh, this is this is kind of where the action is right now. And we're being asked by quite a lot of uh, building clients who have a renovation or a demolition and rebuild project, how, how this can enter back into the into the material stream. Um, effectively, we're quite lucky with aluminium. Uh, and I would pay tribute to my colleagues in the glass industry who are going on a similar uh, journey but have a slightly harder journey to reprocess the glass elements of a facade but we, we're kind of talking a lot with them um, with with aluminium we don't need the demolition process to be particularly onerous or fussy um, we can take the aluminium in the way that it's nearly always been pulled out of a building I think we could probably improve with our friends in the demolition industry in future but right now we can take it as a fairly standard demolition process um, and the aluminium can arrive at a scrap processing facility in a fairly rough form it doesn't have to be of any particular length it, and it definitely comes with other materials from the facade still attached um, and so what we then have to do is separate out all those other parts that are attached to give us something that's fairly um, clean aluminium to then to then reprocess and that's probably the the most um, innovative part is is using some some technology and some you know scrap processing is not necessarily a a sort of you know a laboratory type business um, but we can we can segregate now all the different materials and give us exactly the right alloys from that original building that can go back into the chain the other components can also then be recycled so we get plastics and we get other um, castings and screws and other they can all be separated out and individually reprocessed as well so effectively from a from a building owner's point of view um, they can uh, really uh, if you like have an arrangement through demolition and scrap collection just to ensure that their facade would enter into a, a reprocessing um, uh, mechanism such as I've just described it it would it's actually quite it's quite straightforward for the building owner and now we have the processes it's, it's relatively straightforward for us um, what, what I would say is it's very difficult because this is a continuous process of scrap um, segregation sorting remelting it's not possible really to isolate a particular building's facade content and take it through the chain and send it back to the same building owner that that is a far more difficult process um, but it can certainly enter into the value chain as a as a uh, as post-consumer material then recycled and uh, i mean recently completed is the uh, ilona rose house in soho which i uh, believe is, is the first project in london with a low carbon aluminium facade system using your uh, post-consumer scrap process. Um, yeah. Can you tell me a bit more about that? 
Um, yes, I, I will. I, I ought to be fair uh, that there is another project that was completed at a very similar time, which is the RCA project at um, Battersea, which also used um, similar type of content within the facade system. Um, and it was very interesting with both of those projects. They, the design and specification of those occurred now some years ago. And that was at a point where we were probably still doing our R&D on post-consumer material. So I certainly wouldn't claim that actually they were intended and specified and fully designed around post-consumer content from the word go. What happened, and this is a normal process with innovative materials, is at, 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 at some point during the design and the procurement of those uh, facade materials for Elona Rose, um, we were able to enter our post-consumer material into our normal supply chain of standard products. We'd done all the R&D and it was there. So in fact, that's what the project has, um, which is a, some people might say it looks like almost an accidental way of entering the market with an innovative product, but you have to start somewhere in the chain and, and, and things have moved on a lot now. And so um, we're entering into very active discussions with developers and specifiers to, to bring about the, the, the post-consumer content as a very deliberate carbon reducing act. But the fact is that the, 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 the uh, facade aluminium that holds the glazing in place is using low carbon material. And we, we've estimated that compared to the European average figure, that there's around 360 tons of, of carbon was saved in that, in that process. Um, but to be fair, Ilona Rohn's house has a very, very visible um, facade that also comprises steel, a GRC. So we shouldn't just, uh, probably the recycled content is lurking a little bit behind the most obvious facade components, but it's all still there and it's a unitized, it's a unitized um, blazing system. And um, yeah, it's all fully um, I can't remember exactly what the architectural finishes were, but they're all part of making sure that the recycle content can be can be finished properly, um, durable, guarantees, etc. So yeah, um, we we were very pleased to um, get the the the, uh, the post consumer content into that project, and we hope well it's going to be one of obviously many now. We have a tremendous amount of interest, so it's been a it's been a nice project for us to sort of showcase. Certainly a very recognisable uh, pink building in Soho, isn't it? So, uh, it is. I know it. I know it's had its share of correspondence, and um, I've been reading up a little bit on on do you like it, do you not like it. It's definitely not a. It's not a looky likey um, building, um, but um, yeah, I, I, I suppose our aluminium content is lurking a little bit behind uh, behind the facade. So, uh, but yeah, it's distinctive, and and we're happy to be yeah happy to be part of it. Very good. Well, Graham, thank you very much for explaining so clearly uh, the issues surrounding creating sustainable materials uh, for buildings. So thank you very much. No problem, Peter. You're very, very welcome.